would be an understatement to simply say that bears are hungry. We know that they like to eat, but even if you called them ravenous eating machines, there's much more to the story than bears just liking food. And that's what we're going to talk about today during our live chat here, live from the Riffles platform in Katmai National Park and Preserve. Bear, bears are driven by hunger. It motivates um, their behaviors and much of their biology. So we're going to try to take a deep dive into that story right now with my co-host, Katmai National Park Ranger, Naomi Bo. Naomi, how are you today? I'm great. The gods are with us. It's a beautiful day here on the river. Mike Fitz is here with us in Brooks Camp. And Felicia, Ranger Felicia, is behind the camera. Couldn't be better. And thanks to our producer, Brian, who's working behind the scenes uh, back in California to, uh, to drive the show and bring us all of the great clips that you'll see during the broadcast today. Like I mentioned before, uh, hunger is a powerful motivator for really all organisms, and they feel it in different ways, but I think bears experience a profound hunger that's different than what many mammals and people uh, happen to experience. We're going to try to answer your questions during the live chat about this topic today, too. So if you have questions about that, uh, drop those questions in the chat. We have a, a, a moderator from Explode.org, Courtney, who's going to be looking for those questions, and she'll be sending those in our direction. We're going to be glancing at our notes and our iPads for uh, those questions periodically uh, throughout the broadcast. So yeah, Naomi, people know that bears are hungry. Uh, they know that they like to eat. But I think we should start with maybe a basic fact about brown bears, and that is, why are they so hungry? Why do they need to eat so much food? Well, and they're basically driven by the fact that they don't have any food. They don't have anything to eat from essentially November until almost June. Um, and if you didn't eat that long, you'd be a ravenous eating machine as well. And none of us weigh a thousand pounds. So um, they, they need to eat to not only make up for what they've lost and what they haven't had during hibernation, um, but they, they need to put that weight back on and not just weight, they need to put fat back on. And so when, when they're hibernating, um, it's not bad for them their hunger abates and um, their metabolic needs are less um, so it lessens the desire and need for food but as they slowly come out of hibernation and their body metabolism shifts um, then they really start to get hungry and um, then they have to rely on whatever they can find when they get out for a while because there's not, not that much around um, so from the time they exit the den until the salmon return around here, it's it's pretty sparse. So um, Mike, um, not all calories are the same. No, not all calories are the same for bears, and that's one of the really sort of fascinating things to observe when you're watching bears. You can see it on the bear cams. You can see it in other environments. Maybe if you have the opportunity to see a bear in person, uh, bears. Uh, you know, for you want to think about it in a in a very simplistic sense, um, they need to eat a year's worth of food, like you were talking about, in six months. So they have to be extremely efficient um, in their foraging strategies. It's just not going out on the landscape and eating like willow twigs or something like that. So uh, their brown bears are, are we, we tend to associate brown bears, especially here at Brooks River, as you're looking at um, this clip from last year of bears all over the waterfall. We tend to think of them as carnivores, but they're very much like us in that they're generalist omnivores. That's a much more accurate way to describe their true dietary needs and behaviors. Uh, and hibernation makes them different than other animals because they need to eat that year's worth of food in about six months uh, to survive. And body fat is that savings account for them. So they have to be very efficient when they're digesting um, their foods. They have to be very efficient when they're seeking out foods themselves. And uh, with winter fast approaching, you know, um, you know, this is the season right now where bears are going to start to bulk up for This is probably the bears right now at their at their skinniest point in the year. So what what foods, you know, we're going to talk about salmon and their importance to bears in a little bit. Um, what foods in general across Katmai might bears be seeking out to sort of satisfy that hunger? 
Yeah, I mean, we do think of them as carnivores because we watch them fish for salmon, and that is the most important part of their diet here. Um, and But when they come out of hibernation and they're roaming around here and, and they begin to get hungrier and hungrier, um, so they're really eating grasses and sedges, um, uh, which is a type of grass that may be a little bit more nutritional than, than just regular grass as we think about it. And here you see a bear chomping on grass because it really isn't much else. And we're talking about coastal brown bears. We can talk about grizzly bears like in Yellowstone or um, Denali. They don't have the ready access. Um, that's one of Holly, I mean, that's one of Grazer's Cubs, I love that cub. Um, we talk about um, grizzly bears, um, they're smaller because their diet doesn't contain as much fat as, as is available for the bears here, um, and they're, they have a much more varied diet. And so in the spring it's grasses and sedges, then it's salmon, and sort of late summer and fall, there are other things for them to eat which they like, like um, like berries, and there's there's lots of that around here, so they get to have um, vegetation. So, um, Mike, um, explain how the different calories that they get from salmon and vegetation are important for them. Some some more important than others. Yeah, absolutely. And all you know, all mammals need the proper sort of ratio of protein and sugar and fat. It's the same, you know, people, we need the right amount of that depending on our activity level um, and, our, and our health to stay healthy. Um, and brown bears need that as well. Uh, they need to maintain their muscle mass, so they need to seek out foods that are high in protein. They need to build body fat for winter, as we mentioned before, so they need to seek out sugars and they need to seek out fatty foods to help build, build that body fat. And interesting, interestingly, when, when bears have the opportunity to eat unlimited types of food, like in a captive setting during some experiments, uh, researchers have found that bears select for a diet that's about 17% protein. So you could give them basically like lean fillets of beef and a pile of berries, and they're only usually going to eat about that 17% um, protein and they're gonna focus the rest on berries because the protein allows them to keep their, their maybe their muscles and their bones healthy. Um, and they're, you know, when they're eating animal meats, they're also taking in a, you know, a bunch of calcium. But when they're eating the berries or, um, so a food that's very high in sugar, or they're eating something like, uh, like salmon and skin, salmon skin, um, salmon eggs or something like that, that's high in fat, that really is almost like the ultimate bear diet because it allows them to maintain their muscle health and maybe even build muscle while at the same time getting fat uh, for winter hibernation. So when you're looking uh, again at bears, they're, they're seeking out these different uh, types of foods. And, and bears also, one of the things that complicates this is that bears are a dietary chimera, I like to say, because they are um, members of the carnivore um, order of mammals but they, again, they're a generalist omnivore. And many bears, many brown bears, specifically across North America, their diet is maybe about 90% plants. Uh, but they don't have specialized organs like a deer would, like a moose, um, like, a, like a cow that would allow them to digest uh, rough plant matter efficiently. So they can gain some nutrition out of plants, um, but they, they can't do it as well as real, like what you would consider more herbivorous um, animals themselves. So they have to they have to look very specifically for the foods at the right time of the year that will give them um, the I guess the, the easiest amount of digestible um, energy uh, for them. And that actually brings up kind of a question that came in in advance. And we thank everybody who submits questions to us through our um, Ask Your Bear Cam uh, question or, you know, during the live chats. Uh, but uh, this question came from Pam, who wrote in and said, I, I've read that bears' teeth have adapted so they can eat berries and other vegetation. Are these adaptations unique to bears or common in other um, omnivore mammals? And yeah, with, with brown bears and with black bears, not so much with polar bears, because they are definitely much more carnivorous than brown and black bears. But 
in brown bears, black bears in North America, their, their molars tend to be a, a slightly more flattened than what you can consider a true carnivore, like lynx, for example, bobcat. Um, so that is certainly true. But the other adaptations that brown bears have that don't have digestive plants, process plants, is a slightly elongated um, digestive tract. Uh, so their intestines are a little bit longer, just has a little bit uh, longer uh, of, a, of a time to get through the um, uh, through their digestive tract and maybe just absorb a little bit more energy out of it. Uh, with other omnivores, I think that's the case as well. I mean, if you look at like raccoons, for example, you look at their skull, you look at their teeth, um, they have, you know, definitely signs that they have sort of like a, a, you know, a heritage of animals that have eaten a lot of meat in the past. Uh, but they also have like um, digestive uh, adaptations and, and tooth adaptations that help them process a wild variety of foods. Even um, coyotes too will have this as well. And coyotes um, will eat a lot of animals, small animals, but they also eat uh, certainly a lot of uh, a lot of plant matter as well. So yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add. Well, no, I was about. just saying that you know we're classic omnivores, right? And our teeth are adapted for that as well. You think we can get bears to eat white socks? <laughs> They don't eat biting insects, unfortunately, for us. So darn, that would be great. I mean, another parallel to um, to humans um, are various hormones. I mean, they have very many of the same hormones that we do, only when things um, change in, our, in these in several hormones, what can be adapted for bears can be very unhealthy for us. The two main hormones I'm thinking about are ghrelin and leptin. And ghrelin is a hormone that makes us hungry, makes us want to eat. Leptin is a hormone that regulates our hunger and lets us know when we are full. And when bears are um, going into hibernation or when they're here, their ghrelin is really active. And, um, on hyperdrive, you might say, and when they go into hyperphagia, which is that time just before they're going into hibernation, they're hungry all the time. You see it in cubs, you see all the bears, they gotta eat. They are very, very hungry. So, um, um, and then um, the leptin kind of is less for them. They lose that control. Now, if that happened to us, and we would gain all that fat, we would, um, but we would get insulin resistance where our cells are not able to use sugars very well and that leads to type 2 diabetes. But bears go into insulin resistance when they are hibernating but, but they don't get diabetes. And then when they come out of hibernation, insulin resistance is gone and, and they're okay. So imagine if we could figure out what that mechanism was and how, how important that would be for humans and, and our adaptations. So, um, you know, it's, you know, the one other interesting fact about humans is when humans work on a night shift, um, it upsets their ghrelin and leptin levels and they, people almost invariably will um, get hungrier and gain more weight. So I just think it's an interesting parallel that has to do something with sleep cycles. And um, scientists are working on that. I can't wait to learn more. Um, <clears throat> there's also an equation of energy in and energy out that's really important for bears. Mike, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, the economics of energy is extraordinarily important for brown bears, and this is one of my favorite topics to discuss. Uh, I think, uh, again, when, when bears need to eat a year's worth of food in about six months, they have to do it very efficiently. So just thinking about like calories as profit, right? So you have to um, eat, a, you have to, they have to gain a year's worth of profit in that six months of time before uh, they go into their dens. And they're, then they're just living on their savings account during that, during that time, um, ultimately. Uh, but, you know, wild bears typically don't have a choice of unlimited food. I mentioned before how like in, in captive situations, given unlimited food, they're gonna eat about like, you know, 17% protein or something like that. But in the wild, bears don't have that opportunity. So they're looking for foods that really the commonality between all sought after bear foods is that they're, they're high energy 
and they contain a lot of digestible energy. So salmon is a classic example of this, not only high in protein, but also high in fat. And when a bear is eating salmon, like uh, the one that we're watching right, right now, uh, eat, we can think of each bite that a bear takes as a choice. It doesn't matter if the bear is grazing on vegetation, or if it's seeking out berries, or if it's stripping the skin off of a salmon because that bear is making a conscious choice about selecting for the most digestible food that's available to it in that moment in time. With, with, um, with bears eating salmon when they're, wide, uh, when they're well fed, we call that, um, when they're selecting for the fattiest, fattiest parts of the fish, we call that high grading. And that's when bears are stripping the skin off of the fish, they're eating the brains, they're eating the eggs, and they're often leaving the fillets behind because that, uh, those parts of the fish are are the fattiest. Um, so bears are really good at digesting protein, they're really good at digesting sugar, but they're also extraordinarily good at digesting fat. So they're basically taking that fat directly from the fish and putting it into their fat reserves. And they choose for that. Yes, absolutely. And we haven't really seen that yet because we haven't had salmon alive in Brooks River so far, which is an anomaly. Um, but yeah, when, when, when you see bears selecting for certain foods, it's a think about it as a, a, a physiological adaptation it's it's a conscious behavior that they're that they're doing um, bears are walking through the landscape making decisions specifically about the foods um, that they are finding so it's a it's a conscious sort of in a sense adaptation for them that allows them um, overall to survive um, so bears yeah you know, they experience great hunger they make choices about the types of food that they that they want to eat but Naomi no matter what foods bears seek out in Katmai especially for the bears um, along Brooks River, where, um, where we're standing near us. I mean, salmon is of utmost importance uh, to them. So yeah, let's talk a little bit more now about salmon. And um, a great question to answer at this point in our, in our live chat is, why do bears come to Brooks River? Well, bears come to Brooks River because it's an amazing source of salmon. Um, Bristol Bay, where the salmon come from, um, I mean, they're in the Pacific Ocean, then they come into the Bering Sea, and then into Bristol Bay, and then into various watersheds. And the watershed that we're in is the Naknek watershed, and salmon are coming back to spawn. They, they come through this river to come back to where they were born, and, um, and they will find their spawning sites. And the bears are their final obstacle to, to spawning. And um, salmon are the most important thing. They provide fat and energy for the bears that will really give them the ability to survive that long period of deprivation. And, um, and bears make sacrifices to that. Bears are generally solitary animals, except when they're um, uh, in family groups. But they figure it out a system how to be around each other and be in this high concentration of fellow bears, which they're not used to. And bears don't want to fight. If, if they're injured in a fight, then, you know, they could be out for the season. So they figure out a way to be around bears, which helps them figure out a way to be around us. And we're not necessarily the easiest animals to be around. Um, but um, they learn to tolerate each other and make the most out of this environment and, um, and achieve their objectives in getting fat and to survive. So um, speaking of salmon and survival, Mike, where are you hiding the fish? <laughs> in my back pocket. <laughs> I got about 200,000 just ready to release when I feel like it. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a question I think that's been on the minds of a lot of people tuning into the bear cams over the past couple of weeks because the cams went live on uh, it was June 16 this year, and often uh, we see a lot of salmon in the river by this time. In fact, within my experience of, uh, at Katmai, you know, going back to 2007, um, that was my first summer having any sort of experience around um, around Brooks River. We had um, you know variable numbers of salmon, but in late June, especially by this late in June, we've always had like it seems like one big push of salmon. We can see a few salmon jumping at the waterfall, um, maybe even bears fishing from time to time, but we haven't seen that yet this year. And so I know that's a question weighing on the minds of a lot of people. Where are uh, the salmon? Now, I don't know, um, but I have I have some 
uh, I'd like to throw out an educated um, guess or a hypo hypothesis on where they might be. Uh, because ocean temperatures really affect the migration of salmon, where they are in the North Pacific in the wintertime, and, and maybe the timing of their return through the Bering Sea and into Bristol Bay and then here into Katmai National Park. So again, if you're not familiar with the geography of this area, um, Katmai National Park is located um, in southwest Alaska, so it's sort of wedged in between the Bering Sea and the North Pacific. But the salmon that come the Brooks River have to swim around the Alaska Peninsula through the Aleutian Islands and then head up through the Bering Sea to the north side of the peninsula and then come back into, um, into Katmai to spawn. In years, from what I've been reading, in years where um, the ocean temperatures in the North Pacific are a little colder than average, then sockeye salmon might spend those winters a little bit farther south. So when they decide it's time to head back up uh, north, back to their spawning grounds, they have farther to go. So that could be one reason why we haven't seen uh, a lot of salmon yet. The, uh, the other factor happens to be sea surface temperatures in Bristol Bay itself. I've read, um, there was a reference in a, in a book uh, about salmon that I found that talked about how um, the maturation of the, the gonads in salmon um, is, is slowed down when sea surface temperatures in low. Like, and that's what's happening this year. I just checked the sea surface temperature map um, for the Bering Sea earlier today. And some of the temperatures were like less than 45 degrees Celsius. So it's it's pretty cold out in that water. So again, like, um, you know, the, the eggs in a female aren't maturing um, as rapidly as they would. So maybe they're like, ah, oh, it's not quite time for me to get into fresh water yet. Um, but also, um, there was another there was another reference um, in that same book that said, uh, I mean, I'm just going to look at my note here so I get it right. Uh, the peak return date for a river, a major salmon river just north of Katmai, uh, for the sockeye, the return date was inversely related um, to water temperature in June, meaning that when water temperatures were colder in the Bering Sea, then salmon arrived in that river later. And, um, and I think that's probably what is, what is maybe happening in the Naknek River watershed. Uh, and the fact, and that, that maybe explains the reason why we're not seeing salmon um, in Brooks River right now. Right? Yeah, and also um, one of our natural resource people commented to me a couple weeks ago um, that um, maybe three weeks ago the water temperature in the Brooks River was 40 degrees, and in the last few years it's normally been 50 degrees. So if you know if that's true about the maturation of the salmon, they're really wanting to stay in warm waters for a bit. They well, you know, in a sense, and again, I'm not sure, once they get into fresh water, this is like ideal conditions. Salmon are just primed for cold water conditions. So I wouldn't fret or worry about the lack of salmon right now, for sure. It's certainly anomalous compared to, at least for my experience. Uh, but when the salmon get here, it's going to be ideal conditions for them because there's a lot of water. Water levels in Naknek Lake are kind of up for the year from what I observed in, over the few days that I've been here. Quite a bit of water going through Brooks River. Um, so when the salmon get here, they're going to have pretty much ideal conditions for migration to find um, their, their spawning site. So this change was unexpected, um, sort of like the lack of salmon that we're seeing right now, but it's not, at least in my opinion, not worrisome yet. And the salmon are coming. In fact, um, there was about, I think, uh, two days ago, 30,000 fish that entered the Naknek River watershed. And yesterday, about 40,000 more salmon that entered the Naknek River watershed. Probably more that are coming in the watershed today, so we could have fish showing up um, in Brooks River really at any moment. So you yeah, keep watching the webcam, watch Brooks Falls, watch the underwater cam to see um, for those um, uh, for those first uh, large pulses of salmon uh, to arrive. And, and Naomi, I was standing at the falls last night hoping to see a bear. I didn't see any, but um, you know, I was I was waiting with anticipation for the for the salmon too. Uh, so, you know, if you're feeling that at home, I feel it as well. Naomi feels it, the rangers feel it, and the bears feel it as well. You know, for for them, salmon means something different to, to you to you and I. We're only tangentially making our living off of salmon because we talk about bears <laughs> because the bears are here for the salmon. But for the bears, uh, salmon is of utmost importance uh, to them. So let's talk a little bit about um, bear fishing strategies at Brooks River, maybe what we're going to see once bears start to fish for salmon. And again, think about it in, um, I guess, a great way for us to frame it is to talk about efficiency and what maybe what fishing strategies are efficient and maybe what drives bears to, to utilize less fish, uh, less efficient uh, fishing strategies. Yeah, so, um, you know, 
bears, you know, you got to work to get results, right? Same thing with bears fishing for salmon. They're going to be expending energy to take it in. So they want to be taking in more calories than they're spending. So there's some more fishing stock, some fishing styles which are more efficient than others. And the classic is watching and waiting. And the master of that is Otis Bear 480, the Zen master, who sometimes you think he's falling asleep and sometimes he actually is. But he is staring down at the river and he patiently waits to catch salmon. So he's moving less, eating more. And there is, Otis is not only beloved by all of us, but he has a record for catching salmon. He was observed catching 42 salmon in five and a half hours. Look at that, Chad. I mean, and that's, a lot, that's almost 200,000 calories. And um, Mike confirmed to me that um, he ate most of those fish. It's not like he was hydrating and taking a portion of the calories. So it's no wonder he's a four-time Fat Bear Week champion. Um, he knows how to take in more calories than he's spending. Another um, great method of fishing is fishing from the lip of the falls. Now to do this, um, bears have to master the technique because it's not easy for a seven or 800 pound bear or even um, a, and especially a smaller subadult to brace themselves on that slippery rocky surface at the edge of the falls. And, um, and here you see bears doing that. But if they can do that, they're not running around, they're just catching fish from that one position. So it's a very efficient way of catching fish. And one of our great champs is 128 Grazer, who um, is dominant enough to own the falls. Um, we also see 151 Walker use the falls more and more later in the season. He doesn't really want to fight for that position. And of course, we've been watching um, Bear Family 909 and 910, who are offspring of uh, Beat Nose, Bear 409, who is the iconic bear fishing on the lip. Um, the famous photographer Mangelson got that classic picture of her catching fish on the lip. So if they can master that technique, it's a great way to be efficient. Um, Mike, let's, let's talk about some less efficient methods of fishing and why a bear might do that as opposed to these more efficient methods. Yeah, I think, you know, the commonality between a lot of the fishing techniques that you mentioned, Naomi, was that the bears basically are just waiting for their food to come to them in those situations. So they're standing or they're sitting. But there's other strategies that bears are forced to employ. And we'll, I'll go over kind of three of these briefly, but I want everyone to think about, um, you know, what would motivate a bear to, to utilize these rather than um, simply standing somewhere or sitting somewhere waiting for the salmon. Uh, to come to them. And the first one that you'll see employed almost universally amongst bears here, and I think this is a cultural, uh, I guess, uh, characteristic of these bears here. This is part of their foraging culture, and that is just searching for sand um, by sticking their faces in the water. We nicknamed that snorkeling. You'll see that happen at the falls. You'll see it especially happen uh, near the mouth of Brooks River, especially late in summer. And bears are doing this because they know there's food under the water. They're looking for um, they're, they're looking for um, anything essentially that can't swim away, um, so they can pick that up um, easily. So snorkeling is a is a, is a technique that gives bears um, you know that opportunity to to forage fairly efficiently. They're not necessarily expending a whole lot of energy while they happen uh, to be doing this. But you'll see it almost universally employed. But this is a learned behavior too. I don't think you can take a bear uh, from like a different habitat that hasn't had experience fishing for salmon and put them in a place where there's salmon and, and see them doing this. We, we also see, we've seen on the camps, bears learning from their moms how to fish. I mean, we 402 is a champion lip fisher and she brings her clubs up there. 128 has done that. So we actually see that happen, that behavioral transfer, so to speak. 
Yeah, absolutely. So you know, we'll see that as a, a cultural phenomenon. Bears here, fairly efficient in its in, in its energetic reward. Now, the other one that you're going to see probably at this time of the year, especially since the salmon are a little bit late this year, when they come, when the salmon show up in large numbers, and we start to see bears fishing for them in the river, you're going to see certain bears chasing salmon throughout the water. So think about the motivation of that bear chasing fish through the water. Like a mother bear who's trying to feed her cubs, she's been subsisting on the very last of her fat reserves uh, until this point in time. So she's going to be running through the water, chasing after salmon, almost with like a desperate hunger. You'll see other bears doing that as well. Um, adult males will do it. Young bears will do it. Um, so when I'm, when I'm thinking about bears chasing and I see that happening, I think about really the desperate hunger, um, but also the power that they're employing when they're doing that. Anybody who's ever tried to run through shallow water knows how difficult it is. And I challenge anybody to think that they can run as fast as a bear to go to the pool or to a pond or whatever, or a beach and try to run through two feet of water and see how fast you can do it. There's absolutely no way you can do that as fast as a brown bear. So when we see them doing this again, it's um, it it showcases that they're they're very hungry in that moment in time because they haven't had many good meals, maybe recently or especially at this time of the year, not since last fall for many of the bears. But it also showcases um, showcases their strength and power in the in the situation. I also think seeing I mean we've seen grazer do that at the beginning of the season, right? And I also think that bears lower down in the hierarchy will do that longer because they don't have those prime fishing spots where like the lip or the jacuzzi or the office so they're down here trying to grab fish down and down in the riffles um because they can't get those spots where they use those energy. one of the other more energy intensive fishing strategies is is uh is stealing uh and you know biologically a biologist We'll, we'll call this, I'll throw out a fancy word for everybody that you can use at a dinner party next time someone takes like a brownie off your plate or whatever. It's called kleptoparasitism. Basically stealing from another... Can you say that again? Yeah, kleptoparasitism. Thank you. Yeah, and it, so it's basically stealing from another animal or another organism. And we'll see that happening like with Popeye here stealing uh, from number 83. I think this clip may have been from last year or the year before. This is a risky behavior. Um, it's 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 a bear taking a chance. Um, bears often get injured when they're trying to steal from from other bears. It's a uh, in a way, you know, from our perspective, it's it's unfair, right? Uh, but we have to, when we're watching that behavior, we have to remind ourselves again that uh, we shouldn't be judging the bears by you know the, the standards of human fairness because bears don't apply uh, those standards to their own lives. Uh, maybe maybe we should use the word kleptoparasitism more instead of stealing because stealing connotes something bad for us right, right like you took my fish but i needed that fish i'm hungry yeah so when you're when you're um when you're using words like um to describe the behaviors of wild animals like stealing or if we apply like um if i were to call uh popeye a thief we have to decouple sort of like the stigmas that might be associated with those words but those uh you know again those strategies are, 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 are things that bears will employ when they're forced to. If they could sit at the waterfall all the time and wait for salmon to come to them, they would do that. If they could all dominate access to, or if, if there was enough access to productive fishing spots, that's what they would do. They probably would not be competing. But competition for access to fishing spots, the extenuating circumstances of maybe having a cub or not having a good meal, just showing up at the river um, and wanting to eat as many salmon as you can, that forces bears to maybe take risks, to take chances. Um, so each one of the bears is going to be fishing um, in a slightly different way than the others, based on its hunger and based on its motivations. And that kind of goes back to like the main sort of like the theme of our, our live chat about how hunger motivates bears to behave um, in in different ways. And what, uh, before we move on, Naomi, one of the things that we've been seeing over the past few years is how hunger uh, influences innovation in brown bears. And yes. I think that's a really fun thing uh, oh. to watch for uh, throughout the year. Yeah, there are a couple of young bears who've really taught us a thing or two. Um, a few years ago, if you'd asked me, do bears eat birds? And I would say, yeah, it's too much. That takes too much energy. you got to get rid of all those feathers. But here is 903, who many people have dubbed Gully. And he ran into that group of of gulls and he came out with one. 
and saying, hmm, this, this is pretty good. And he developed a taste for birds. So that's pretty innovative. He was, a, you know, a young bear. He's not getting any prime fishing spots. So uh, he supplements his diet um, with uh, gulls. And there's some good protein in it. So another innovative bear, which um, those of you who've been watching the cams, um, we love to watch, is Bear 164, who has invented a whole new way of fishing. There, here you see him. He goes right under the lip of the falls and catches fish. And I don't know about you, might, I've never seen a bear catch fish. Oh, that's the first, that. first bear I've ever seen fishing consistently in that spot. Yeah, and you know what else is interesting? He's right near the most dominant bears in the jacuzzi, and they let him have that spot, which is another interesting thing. So he's not only found a new place to fish, but he's found a new place to fish where he's not competing with the big boys for the prime spots. So who knows what we so we know one bear ate a beaver, you know, once. So uh, who knows what will happen next? Yes. Um, I, yeah, so I think that's uh, fascinating to watch how, especially bears that can't have access to the most productive fishing spots, will look for a different way to make a living. And again, hunger is driving that, but it's also their intelligence, their skills, their ability to learn by watching one another too. So, you know, I, I used to think, I don't know for whatever reason that, well, I used to think that wild animals were purely acting on instinct, and that is not certainly showcase how wild animals have the ability to, in a sense, reason put two and two together and figure out different ways of making a living. And I think it's, it's great to watch that on the webcams here. Yeah. And, and it's a reminder that hunger is important for survival, right? So innovation is a great tool, just as stealing is a great tool, and these bears need this to survive. Yeah, and um, you know we're going to try to get to some audience questions here in just a moment. I know there's a lot that have come in, so thank you for everybody who submitted your questions. We'll try to um, get to many of those um, in just a few minutes here. Um, before we do so, we have a, a you know one one of the other things that I wanted to talk about essentially was um, when we're talking about hunger and how it brings bears to Brooks River. We also have to consider the seasonality of this phenomenon uh, here because. It, it varies from day to day, varies from season to season, especially. So in general, peak numbers of bears, especially if you're new to the bear camps this year, peak numbers of bears are going to be here in July, then also in late summer and early fall. So watch for that because that corresponds when salmon are most accessible uh, to the bears. But on a daily basis, it can fluctuate wildly. We can have very few bears fishing at the falls, or we can have a lot of bears fishing at the falls. And that often depends on a variety of things. If there are zero salmon, then, um, you know, like at the beginning of the season, you know, like to, you're going to see days like today where there's not going to be any fish. But if there, if the falls is overwhelmed with salmon, then you're not going to see that many at the falls. And it's almost counterintuitive because uh, the bears get full when there, are except, uh, when there are exceptional numbers of salmon at the waterfall. So if you're looking at the webcams and you're seeing 100 fish jumping from net, 200 fish jumping bears, that means that the bears have just gotten their fill and they're off in the forest sleeping it off. Yeah. It's those situations where we see fewer fish at the waterfall, just enough to keep them as interested, and we see those large gatherings of bears, like 15 or 20 bears or more uh, fishing at those falls. Yeah, I, um, when on the falls platform, visitors will frequently ask me, why aren't the bears here? They're all the salmon jumping, but it's, it's because they're full. They're napping getting ready for their, their next fishing expedition. And uh, Naomi, you, you touched on it before, but um, real, real briefly, when we start to see large numbers of fish show up in the river, again, what can we expect um, a bear to eat on a good day? What's what's their, you know, we have that, the the, um, the curve was set by Otis, right? Yeah, the jam. You know, you know, more than 40 fish in about five and a half hours. I witnessed them eating most of those fish. And then the webcam audience counted the rest for me that evening. <laughs> but what, what can bears typically, you know, put down in a, in a good fishing trip? Well, but, um, so they could they could put down 100,000 calories in a good fishing day. Mike and I once did a count on um, 128 catching fish on the lip, and it was more than 20 fish from the lip of the falls. 
which is incredible. Now, she wasn't eating the whole fish, and she had cubs with her. So she wasn't getting as many calories as, as Otis was, but it just shows it's another, you know, if, if a bear has figured out a method of fishing that works for them, then they can really fill up. And you see it. See how fat they get and how fat they return. I mean, speaking of this year, there haven't been a lot of bears here, but the ones that have returned, they're not that skinny. They, they lose weight for a while, but they're, they're just not that skinny. So, um, yeah, um, bears can, I mean, that's, that's a lot of calories. Yeah, I remember reading a, a, a question uh, from a viewer, um, and I didn't put it in, in the queue to answer today, but somebody was wondering, like, they, they, they saw that the bears looked pretty good, and why that might be. And partly it's because they haven't started to really shed their fur yet, so they don't look as haggard as they will maybe in a couple of weeks or so. But the other reason is that, you know, they're, they're subsisting on um, the bounty from last year still. So it's been several good years of strong salmon runs in this area. And that's been, that's been great for the bears. Yeah. Um, they've been doing really, really well because of that. So if you see a bear like 747 show up at the waterfall and he looks really big, that's because, yeah, he had a really good year last year and the year before and the year before that and the year before that. Another good example of that is bear 503. Because 503 was born in a time of abundance and so he's been able to grow really large as a young adult and perhaps if he had been here ten more than 10 years earlier when the salmon ones were and not as regular he wouldn't be as big as he is now so um you know that's that's another bear to watch in terms of um, how big they can get because of how how great this river and filled with salmon. Yeah, so salmon are of extraordinary importance to brown bears, to the people in this area, the the, the human economy um, of, of this area, the um, the indigenous cultures of this area around salmon um, themselves. So we can't really overstate the importance of fish to these animals. Uh, without without salmon, um, you know, bears wouldn't be gathering at Brooks River in large numbers. Our webcams would kind of look like, like what they are right now basically with just a, a, a pretty river with not much activity going on. So the salmon are the keystone, the lifeblood of, of this place. We have to thank them and make sure that we're working to protect, um, you know, uh, their habitats in freshwater and in the ocean too, which which means tackling climate change. So we don't muck up the, the oceans uh, for that part of the salmon's um, life cycle because the bears that we see here are highly dependent um, on, on these fish. Uh, but, you know, We've been, we've been, Naomi, we've been talking a lot about hunger, how it motivates bears, motivates them to make, to make certain decisions, how it motivates their behaviors uh, and their biology throughout the year. Um, but with the remaining time in our live chat here, it looks like we have at least, you know, maybe 15 minutes before the top of the hour. Do you want to try to get to some audience questions? Yeah, let's get to some audience questions. Okay. And it, we, um, we, have, we had, we, the, the microphones that we wanted to use earlier weren't working well for us today, so we switched to a different microphone, meaning we have to talk up or talk louder. So your voice is doing all right? So far. Yeah, I, okay. if it's my voice is not holding up, I have water here. I'll, okay, I'll, all right. I'll tackle it. All right. We don't want, um, I've lost my voice here doing a Valley of 10,000 Smokes bus tour for two weeks. Um, <laughs> because it felt a little hoarse that day and I had to talk at a really loud volume over the noise of the bus. Um, and it just went away and it wouldn't come back for a long time. So that was, that was really weird. And the other, well, I, well, I pick up the questions here as a side note. Everyone whispered to me because I couldn't talk, and it just had a whisper, and everyone thought that I that I wanted them to whisper too, and it was just like, no, I, it, it's fine. I, maybe, just, <laughs> maybe we should do that on the bridge in the falls when talking to people, so that they lower yeah, their voices. Yeah, they lower. That might be an effective strategy because it worked. It worked that time. Uh, all right, yeah. Thanks for your questions, everybody. Um, we, I see that there's a ton here that we'll try to try to answer. Um, One question um, that came in fairly early is about um, have salmon arrived in other streams in Count Line and have bears been observed fishing in, in that location? I, I don't think so. Um, not in Count Line. There are other rivers that have been um, where the salmon counts have been uh, bigger than they have been here, 
but um, I don't know of, of them being around other no. streams, and it's a question that I've asked too. Yeah, it, one of the reasons why there's so many bears that gather at Brooks River is that this is really the first place in Catmull where, where bears can gather to fish for salmon. There's not going to be salmon accessible to bears in other spots. And where the salmon are at right now are basically just like in big lakes or big rivers where, where bears can't catch salmon because there's just too much water. It's easy for the salmon to swim away. Um, so, so the bears don't have access um, to salmon in other places. Now, this isn't the only place that bears fish for salmon. We're only seeing a small subset of bears um, in Katmai at Brooks River, but this is really a vital place for bears in this sort of vicinity to catch salmon. So they're not out, actually out there fishing at other streams. They're doing their best making a living on other foods and waiting for salmon to arrive up where they know where they know to catch them. Um, and Naomi, I mean, what about, um, and this is a question that came in in, in advance even before our chat began, uh, what about the long winter? Did the long winter and late spring make it harder for bears to find food when they emerged from their dens? I know we've been kind of talking about that in the past couple of days. Yeah, um, maybe. I don't think there's much food ever for them to find when they come out of their dens. I mean, I think that the long winter and colder waters have certainly had an effect on the ecosystem here and the timing, but um, there really isn't much for them to eat um, when they get out of the den. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, there's really not. Um, they maybe if they're lucky, you know, an, uh, a bear might stumble upon a winter-killed moose or a caribou or something like that. This is the time of the year when caribou and moose also get birth in. There are bears in Katmai and elsewhere in the Alaska Peninsula that have learned to hunt moose and, and caribou calves. So there could be bears out there in the landscape targeting those foods. Uh, but those foods are available for just a short window. It's really like a week or two at most. After that, the, the, the calves just get too fleet of foot. They're too fast for the bears. So they can run away and outrun the, run the bears. So that's a very short window of time for a very few number of, of bears. But in the spring, even before that, yeah, before the grass greens up, um, they're just surviving on their, on their fat reserves mostly. And that's why, you know, fattening up in the summertime in, in fall is so important for the bears because it's not only for that wintertime hibernation period, right? it's also for that springtime season, which is essentially a starvation season. For well, them. and also mating season. Yes. Where there, there's yeah. activity. I mean, males courting females and following them for maybe weeks at a time, and that uses up energy. So, um, it's amazing that they last as long as they do. And my assumption is that when we talked about the hormones, um, ghrelin and leptin, I'm assuming that their, you know, their hunger hormone is not ramped up right away when they come out of the den. They have to slowly adjust to being out of the den, uh, being more awake, and then hunger slowly ramps up. And I think that's part of how they survive. For sure, for sure. And, and um, studies done on, on, on wild wild bears and uh, when they're coming out of hibernation through like um, just um, implants to monitor like bears' heart rate and, and, and metabolism, uh, they have found that it really takes a bear's a, a bear about maybe like two or three weeks for its body temperature to stabilize sort of at active levels and its heart rate to stabilize at active levels after it comes out of the den itself. So. It's not like a hibernation. It's not a switch for bears. They don't switch it on in the fall immediately. It takes a, it's a long, slow progression into that low metabolism, and then it has to ramp up over a long, long time in the spring. And then also means that their metabolic needs are less. Right. Right. They don't really need as much to survive when their metabolisms are are slow. Um, and sort of same in, in humans. If humans have a slower metabolism, they don't need as many calories to survive, so um, I, that's part of what's happening. And, um, you know, since, since the salmon aren't here right now, it's a little later than average for them to get here, um, those first big waves of fish, somebody was wondering, does the late arrival of salmon also mean that the bears may hang around the falls uh, later into the fall? Maybe, it depends on the salmon run. And, Bears have been hanging around the falls a lot longer than we classically think about. I mean, August, there's still a lot of bears around, and we used to think of 
August is a time when the bears left for the smaller creeks and streams where um, after the salmon run had, had passed here. But um, I mean, last time I was here in August, I remember like August 9th, 63 bears in the falls. And bears have been hanging out. So I think it's possible. One of the things that the late arrival of the salmon won't influence is the timing of the spawn. And that's like, if, if the salmon are available to bears late into, into the fall, they would be here. But um, salmon will will spawn, the peak of their spawning here in Brooks River is in September. And then spawning um, kind of quickly tapers off into October. It really kind of depends on how many fish are available in, in late summer. It's not going to affect the timing of the spawning overall. So I think the salmon are still going to get their, their business done. Uh, at, at about the same time. So we may not see bears sticking around the falls later into October than average because the salmon arrived late. Because the salmon are still going to experience like the water cooling down in October, probably around the same time period. So that's my best guess, is that it's not going to affect the salmon spawning uh, or the timing of that process. So as a result, we may not see bears you know, sticking around. But stranger things have happened. <laughs> uh, the bears and salmon prove me wrong all the time. So if that happens, you can point at me and be like, look, Mike, you're wrong again. And, and, that, and they will. And they will. And that's, and that's cool with me. That's, <laughs> that's part of the, that's part of the, part of the job. That's why we get paid the big bucks. <laughs> uh, it, Amy, you mentioned um, Otis eating oat, uh, salmon, um, or over 42 salmon in a sitting. One time somebody was wondering, do you think that the Otis record of 42 fish will ever be broken? Ah, something for you guys to watch. Talk about citizen science. Um, Let's see if that record can be broken. Um, we have many ambitious young bears. Let's see. And some that, you know, I think we've seen kind of sit there and learn from Otis. Um, I think um, Otis has mentored 151, right, over years. Let's see. Um, you guys can have a, um, a contest to see who beats Otis's record. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's going to be a tough... We, we see bears, it's going to be a tough record to beat. We see bears catching a lot of salmon, though. What was really unique about that situation with Otis is that he was eating most of the fish. I was on the platform, on the falls platform, watching that happen. So he wasn't like, you know, Lefty, Lefty will come to the falls, and he'll, on a good fishing day, he'll catch a lot of fish. He'll be, like, taking a bite out of the head and dropping it, catching another one. It's not quite the same as, like, Otis eating the entire fish. But, um... Records get broken. Uh, I'm a hockey fan. I never thought anybody would have the possibility of breaking Wayne Gretzky's all-time goal total record, but it looks like Alex Ovechkin might have that opportunity, which is kind of amazing. So yeah, um, it it could it could happen. I'm not going to say never, but um, it may be a long, long time before we see that happen. But we'll need the webcam viewers maybe to help us out with with that. Babe Ruth, Wayne Gretzky, <laughs> and Otis. Uh, so, um, let's see, uh, what are, this is an interesting question, um, what are some of the surprising things that a bear, a bear would eat? Hmm. I know, I can think of a few off the top of my head. Well, why don't you start, okay. because, uh, you, you've, uh, seen them eat more surprising things than Yeah. That. Uh, human feces. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> that's not off the table, um, certainly. If really anything that's really smelly and interesting for them, they're gonna they're gonna explore. Um, so I and even their own vomit, like they'll vomit and they'll be like, kind of like a dog will. They'll be like, oh, you know, I mean, we can't let that go to waste. Build buildings. They like to eat buildings. <laughs> they'll, they'll chew on they'll chew on buildings. Um, they can be very you know, they're very very curious in so many different ways. So yeah, those are kind of the the two stranger things that I've um, seen them eat. But they, even on the coast of Katmai National Park. Um, mussels that are attached to, to rocks, so if you could buy valves, um, they'll eat those, even barnacles, they kind of scrape off with their teeth, probably terrible for their teeth, but yeah, um, they'll, they'll do that as well. So yeah, if, um, if we were to list all of the bear foods that are known um, in Katmai and elsewhere, that's all we would be doing during this broadcast. So we'd just be talking salmon, sedge, grass, and then it would, you know, whale carcasses, and then it would just go on. Um, on the coast of the park, another surprising thing too is sea otters. Right. They'll hunt for seals and sea otters on the, on the coast of Catlin as well. Yeah, that's, you know, good calories. 
Uh, what about, uh, Naomi, what about the, the clay that bears heat? We'll see this in the fall, especially down in the mouth of Brooks River, like on um, the River River Watch camera. Right below that, that camera, there's a, there's a layer of um, volcanic ash that has weathered into clay. And somebody was wondering about that. Uh, I'm curious if the clay that bears eat when they're trying uh, to resolve digestive issues has ever been analyzed to see what it contains. Oh, I don't know. Uh, probably. Well, yeah, um, volcanologists have done it. We haven't done it. I don't think biologists have really looked at it to see if it necessarily what it's giving them. But, um, but I know volcanologists have looked at that ash layer because that ash layer is from the 1912 um, eruption of, of Nova Rupta volcano. Uh, it's six thick here um, at Brooks River because Brooks River was upwind of that eruption. On parts of the coast of Katmai, it was somewhere near nearly three feet thick, um, and that's that was downwind of the eruption. And near the eruptive center, um, it was upwards of hundreds of feet thick with pyroclastic flows and ash fall. So it was one of the largest volcanic eruptions in the recorded history, and one of the five largest um, eruptions in re in recorded history, I should say. So it's larger than Krakatoa, larger than Mount St. Helens in 1980. Uh, but it wasn't that bad for, relatively speaking, for what happened here. It contains really just a lot of silica. It was almost, it's almost pure silica. It has some other um, elements and minerals in there, but yeah, it's... It's, it's a lot of just fragmented glass that is a particles by the top. But we think, I think the hypothesis is, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it gives them, um, it, it may act as an anti-diarrheal agent for them, so it's kind of like, um, you know, over-the-counter Imodium AD or something like that. Yeah, or Pepto. Pepto-Bismol. It's not pink, but... Yeah. Right. <laughs> or um, maybe to rid their, their digestive tracts of, um, of parasites as well. Yeah, which we all know that they get. Sound. Yeah, so uh, um, while well, I look for another question, I mean, you want to talk about maybe the one of the unintended consequences of eating salmon for bears? Yeah, um, so one of the unintended consequences for bears are they get um, parasites from the salmon. And we see these long white strings hanging from their butts um, later in the season. And, um, you know, they don't seem to harm the bears at all that seem to uh, take away too many calories, but it's kind of gross. Yeah, and um, you'll see it later in the fall, so um, it's it's one of those pleasant sights to look, to look <laughs> forward to every day. Um, well, I think we might have time for just a couple of more questions. I know you mean I don't want to lose our voice, but thanks for sticking with us today. Thanks for all of your questions. We apologize for not being able to get uh, to, to all of them. Uh, uh, Naomi, somebody was wondering about uh, the salmon migration. And is the salmon migration related to the summer solstice? Huh. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, salmon to me are just amazing, and I think there are a number of biological mechanisms that give them cues and keys, but I don't know about the summer solstice. In this area, it does seem to be tied with where, well, let me back up and say, with all salmon um, migrations, no matter where they happen to be, whether they happen to be uh, on the coast of California or uh, coming up into British Columbia or into Alaska, it's it's dependent on the time of the year. In California, a lot of the salmon um, runs are wintertime runs, so it's not tied to the summer solstice, but a different time of the year because, again, salmon are looking for... Um, not only the ideal time to lay their eggs, but also the ideal time to migrate upstream. And what, when can they get the ideal conditions for that? And in California, with winter rains and snow melt, that seems to be like the ideal times for um, for uh, species like um, Chinook salmon and for um, and for coho salmon. Up in the Bristol Bay area, uh, winter time is not a great time to migrate right. uh, because there's less water in the rivers. There's a lot of ice. Um, but so summertime is the ideal time for the upstream migration in the Bristol Bay area. So for these fish, for the sockeye salmon and other salmon species that utilize the Katmai region, yeah, summertime is it. It is tied to the summer solstice, but each salmon run, each salmon stock, as they're called by biologists, um, are, are, are individually um, adapted and they have the instinct to go upstream at certain times of the year, depending on that individual watershed. Yeah. In Brooks River, um, has that migration in the early summer, but they don't have them spawning until late summer, which is kind of unique 
for um, for certain streams in in the Katmai in the Katmai region. So. And an advantage for the bears. Yep. Well, that's um, you know, lots to talk about, Naomi. I um, I enjoyed the conversation with you today. It's great to be at Brooks River. I'm really looking forward to sharing my experience um, with everybody on the webcams over the next couple of weeks or so. Um, what are you looking forward to seeing um, soon? Bears. <laughs> bears. Bears, just like your bears. I mean, we here are just like you. We want to want to see bears, and we want to see the salmon. Um, I also have an idea for your next book. Oh, really? The Bear Diet. Okay. I, yeah, there's definitely, I think, opportunities to expand on, on that. Much as, as much well. better than the tail. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for joining us today, everybody, um, on this live chat brought to you by Explorador, Katmai National Park, and the Katmai Conservancy. We're going to be back with another live chat, same bear time, same bear channel, next week. Ranger Felicia and I are going to be talking about salmon and their importance to the ecosystem. We're looking forward to that. And join us tomorrow, uh, same time for our uh, a play by play live from Brooks River um, from Katmai National Park. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. My co-host has been Ranger Naomi Boak with Katmai National Park. And until we talk to you again, enjoy the bears. <laughs>